my name is Neetu and I work as a science editor at Joe. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our guest editor and host for the webinar, Dr. Louise Steele. Uh, Louise earned her PhD in molecular biology from Case Western Research University and currently works as an assistant professor of biological sciences at Kent State University. University. Uh, she uses C. elegans as a model organism to study the biological effects of ultrasound, uh, which is used in diagnostic and therapeutic uh, medical procedures. Uh, in fact, her group developed a method for exposing C. elegans to ultrasound and observed that they exhibited uh, exposure dependent reductions in movement, reproduction, and survival. So when I initially approached her to serve as a guest editor with us, I presumed we would be starting a collection with the focus being core research, uh, but she proposed curating a collection that focuses on low tech, low cost methods that can be employed at uh, undergraduate institutions and uh, other research settings where a full fledged research laboratory is not established. Um, so as someone who loves to communicate uh, science to a younger audience, this seemed uh, like a perfect idea to me. Uh, you will hear more about the collection from Louis herself. Uh, but in brief, we have six video articles so far, uh, three of which will be presented today. Um, and I hope you find uh, this uh, webinar useful. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite uh, Louis to uh, begin the webinar. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Neetha. As Neetha said, I'm a, an assistant professor, and I do a lot of teaching at Kent State University at Salem. And I was very pleased with the response that we got for the collection. Uh, if you've checked that out, you see there are nine articles that deal with a wide range of topics, all focusing on how C. elegans can be used in undergraduate research, and in other settings where you may not have the latest and greatest equipment uh, or personnel or funding. Um, the methods were very uh, broad from single worm DNA extraction to freeze crack methods for looking at the germline and so much more. So to narrow down our topic today, uh, we brought together three authors who have written about studying the nervous system, uh, either the motor or sensory nervous system from a structural or functional standpoint. Um, and they're going to spend about 10 minutes each sharing their methods with us. And then we'll have time to open it up for questions at the end. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Jessica Tanis. She's an assistant professor of biological sciences at the University of Delaware. And her lab studies an ion channel called calcium homeostasis modulator one. And their work has led to several very diverse projects, uh, including studying signaling at the neuromuscular junction. So today she'll be telling us how her lab uses levamisole to study mutants that have altered acetylcholine transmission. And this is a great technique uh, for looking at mutants uh, with alterations in that process. Jessica? All right, good morning, everyone. So our skeletal muscles and C. elegans body wall muscles are functionally equivalent in that they control locomotion. And today I'm going to tell you about a simple assay to measure sensitivity to the acetylcholine receptor agonist sildamisole, and this can be used to demonstrate the functional consequences of altered signaling in the muscle. Oops. First, I'd like to thank Allison Davis, an undergraduate in my lab who wrote and recorded this protocol with me. So acetylcholine is released from motor neurons, and this activates postsynaptic ionotropic acetylcholine receptors. This results in an electrical signal that leads to muscle contraction. And in humans, disruption of cholinergic signaling results in myasthenic syndromes. Now, levamisole is a deworming agent that is used to treat parasitic nematode infections in livestock. And this drug acts by binding to and constitutively activating levamisole sensitive acetylcholine receptors that are only found in nematodes, either 
the, the labamisol sensitive acetylcholine receptors are only in, in nematodes. Um, and this results in paralysis. Altered sensitivity to levamisole suggests defects in the signaling at the neuromuscular junction or defects in muscle function. Now in 1980, Lewis et al. did a phorogenetic screen for levamisole resistant mutants, and they found mutations in genes uh, that encode subunits of the acetylcholine receptor, genes important for acetylcholine receptor assembly and processing, clustering, and genes that function downstream of the receptor itself in calcium release and muscle contraction. Uh, more recently, screens from the Bessero lab that look for more subtle levamisole resistant phenotypes have also found uh, genes that are important for acetylcholine receptor abundance and localization. Now in C. elegans, signaling at the neuromuscular junction isn't just controlled by excitatory cholinergic signaling, it's also regulated by inhibitory GABAergic signaling. And the, the cholinergic signaling, this excitatory signaling causes contraction of the body wall muscles on one side of the body, while the inhibitory GABAergic signaling results in the relaxation of the muscles on the opposing side of the body, and this is what enables the coordinated locomotion that you see in C. elegans. Mutations in either the acetylcholine receptor or GABA receptor cause uncoordinated locomotion, as well as altered sensitivity to levamisole. Now, hypersensitivity or resistance to levamisole has traditionally been assayed by transferring animals to auger plates that contain levamisole and then regularly prodding the worms to determine the time point at which paralysis occurs. We developed a liquid levamisole assay that can be performed on worms that are grown in 24 well plates. And the, this liquid assay eliminates the need for physical manipulation of the animals, which is great for people who've never worked with worms before. The vigorous swimming of the animals in liquid also allows for the quantitation of levamisole induced paralysis for hundreds of worms in just one hour. And this protocol can be performed with both wild type and mutant animals to demonstrate functional consequences of altered signaling at the neuromuscular junction. So first, 24 well plates with nematode growth media are prepared. And then a couple days later, 30 microliters of OP50 E. coli is seeded into the wells. It is essential that the bacterial lawns are completely dry before putting animals into the wells, because if the bacteria is not dry, it mixes with the levamisole solution during the assay, and this turns the liquid cloudy and prevents counting of the worms. The C. elegans themselves are synchronized by bleach prep. Um, so the bleach solution dissolves the adult hermaphrodites, but the eggs inside have a protective eggshell. It's important that the animals not be exposed to the bleach solution for too long, as this can also cause the eggs to disintegrate. Uh, we usually prepare twice as many plates of gravid adults as needed for the bleach prep, just in case we over bleach uh, the first set. 24 hours after the bleach prep, uh, we spin down the starved uh, first larval stage animals, these are synchronized, and determine the number of animals in three microliters. Then we pipette about 20 to 30 L1 C. elegans into each well. It's important not to add too many animals to the well because if there's a lot of animals, it's difficult to perform the assay in the time allotted. The animals then are grown for three days. And at this point, uh, the students are given a blank data sheet in which they can record the number of animals moving at each time point. Then the students add 0.4 millimolar liquid levamisole uh, to each well, and they stagger the time in which they add it to the wells according to the number of assays that are, are the number of wells that are going to be assayed. Students count the number of moving animals in each well every five minutes. I typically find that students can assay um, the number of animals moving every five minutes in 12 wells. 
Um, and so the students will assay the first half of the plate in one hour, and then in a subsequent hour, they assay the bottom half of the plate. Again, recording the number moving every five minutes. For students who don't have a lot of lab experience, counting the number of animals moving every five minutes can be overwhelming. And so as has been done with other pharmacological assays, this assay can also be performed with fewer time points, say counting the worms every 10 minutes. As you can see, exposure to 0.4 millimolar labamisol causes time-dependent paralysis. And this is not observed for the animals that are simply swimming in M9 buffer. Now, evaluation of mutants along with wild type C. elegans allows students to first make predictions about phenotypic effects and then perform experiments to test their hypotheses. Okay, so combining the data from different wells, uh, the students determine the number of worms that are moving at each time point and then use these data to create a survival curve in GraphPad PRISM. So here we show that mutations in the UNC63 acetylcholine receptor subunit and LEV10, which is required for acetylcholine receptor clustering, these cause labamisol resistance. Disrupting the balance of acetylcholine and GABAergic signaling um, also impacts labamisol sensitivity. And so here we see that loss of the gabagated chloride ion channel on 49 causes levamisol hypersensitivity. And again, this is due to disruption of that balance. Uh, pairwise comparisons can be made with the Mantle-Cox test to determine significance between different strains. And for those uh, labs or, or universities, colleges that don't have access to GraphPad PRISM, um, the, the percent of animals moving at each time point can be graphed as the average of the percentages for each well, and this is plus or minus standard error, um, and then graphed using Microsoft Excel. I just want to point out that when I performed this assay with my students last spring, 100% of my students found the UNC63 and LIV10 mutants to be labamisol resistant, and 88% found the UNC49 mutants to be labamisol hypersensitive. Um, and these data are consistent with the phenotypes that have been published. So in conclusion, this assay is a simple and efficient way to quantitate labamisol induced paralysis. Um, and importantly, it does not require picking or prodding of the animals, so it's suitable for undergraduate laboratories, as well as for researchers who are studying the neuromuscular junction. Uh, students actually collect a sizable amount of data, and this can be quantitated and discussed. Importantly, this can be used as a standalone lab in an introductory class uh, to demonstrate the consequence of increasing postsynaptic cholinergic signaling, and it can also be used in a more advanced class with both wild type and mutant animals. By modifying the, 20, the median, the 24 well plates, the labamisol swim assay can also be performed on RNAi knockdown animals. And I actually use this assay to teach students about RNAi uh, with the knockdown resulting in the same labamisol phenotype as the mutants. So one week we perform the assay with the mutants and the subsequent week we perform it with animals that have been exposed to RNAi. And then finally, I use this assay in a course-based undergraduate research experience. So in the first half of the course, the students perform the, the experiment with known mutants. Then in the second half of the course, they perform the assay and, and pick independent genes for their, their own projects. Uh, one year I had students select a gene that was identified in a genome RNAi screen for altered labamisol sensitivity. And last spring, uh, I had students pick a homolog of a gene that is mutated in either congenital myasthenic syndrome or muscular dystrophy for their independent project. So in conclusion, this is a simple, inexpensive labamisol sensitivity assay. It provides a hands-on approach to learning about signaling at the neuromuscular junction. I'd like to thank Allison Davis, again, an undergraduate who 
uh, wrote and recorded this article with me. The students in my advanced genetics laboratory in spring 2022, who uh, produced some of the, the data for this, this article, uh, feedback from the University of Delaware's The Elegans community, and NIGMS and the Delaware INBRI for funding for this project. And thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, that was a great idea to streamline the method in, in liquid, and I appreciate you sharing how your students have used the method and the, all the successes that they've had. Our next speaker will be Melissa Labonte. She's an assistant professor of biology at Southern Oregon University, and her lab is interested in ciliated sensory neurons in C. elegans. Uh, you may be familiar, those are neurons that have a hair-like extension that's exposed to the environment so that it can detect those environmental changes. Dr. Labani is going to tell us about a streamlined method that she uses with lipophilic fluorescent dyes to visualize these neurons. And I think she'll tell us how she's used that to analyze mutants that affect the structure or function of those neurons. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Louise. Uh, so good morning to those of you who are in a similar time zone as me on the West Coast. Um, and hello to everyone else. Uh, so I'm coming to you from Southern Oregon University. This is a small public institution um, of about 5,000 students. Um, and I'm in my second year as an assistant professor teaching at this institution. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about um, DII dye filling as a simple and expensive tool to look at ciliated sensory neurons in C. elegans. So I'll start with a brief introduction to the ciliated sensory neurons. And in particular, I want to point out a set of 20 of these neurons uh, that are e externally exposed. Um, so there are eight of these neurons located in the head of the animal, or sorry, eight pairs of these neurons, um, making up 16 neurons. And these are called the amphids. Um, and then there are two pairs or four neurons located in the tail of the animal called the phasmids. Um, and it's important that these neurons are externally exposed uh, because our staining mechanism relies on the fact that these neurons actually have expo exposure to the environment. So this staining mechanism is called DII dye filling, and it can be used to actually visualize internally these ciliated sensory neurons. So DII is a red fluorescent lipophilic dye. Um, one of the reasons I love working with it with um, undergraduates at a small institution with a small budget is that DII itself costs just about $100 to purchase. And once you get it, um, it comes as a powder, you make it into a solution, and you can store it for years and use the same solution for years. Um, so essentially, what I'm going to describe for you today is this process of synchronizing population of populations of worms and placing them onto seeded worm plates, followed by washing those synchronized worm populations off the plate when ready to do DII dye filling, then putting those worms into dye. Uh, so you swim the worms in dye, and within a few hours, you're able to observe those worms and look at the dye filling within the ciliated sensory neurons. Uh, so I'll start by talking about this synchronization step. Um, and Jessica did a lovely job of introducing ble bleach preparation already, so I'll keep it simple as far as how that works. Um, but essentially, for ble bleach preparation, you can use bleach to isolate fertilized unlaid eggs from adult worms. Um, and as Jessica mentioned, one of the things you do want to watch out for is making sure you bleach these worms without over bleaching and destroying the eggs as well. Uh, so this method is best for using on strains that have egg retention defects. Um, and in particular, this is going to include many sensory neuron genetic mutants, including the ones that I will talk about later in this um, short demonstration. 
Uh, this is also best for when you have experiments with time constraints. So if you're working in a single lab setting, for example, doing bleach preparation is great because it's something you can complete in just a couple of minutes. Um, the alternative method for synchronization is timed egg laying. This is where you allow adults to lay eggs on plates for a set period of time. Um, and this is also a great way to ensure you have a roughly synchronized population of worms on each of your plates. This is best for strains that don't have egg retention defects. Uh, so if you're interested in looking at any mutants that don't appear to have problems with laying their eggs on plates. Um, and it's also useful for research that has fewer time constraints where you're not trying to fit something within a single class period, for example. Um, so now I'll go through dye filling. Um, essentially, this is this process of washing synchronized worms off of a plate, swimming them in DII dye, and observing them. So that process of collecting worms, even if you're doing that in a classroom setting, usually only takes about 15 minutes for students to do this. Um, and then the staining process, uh, we typically recommend two hours, but other publications have even done this anywhere from an hour to a few hours. Um, and depending on the length of time you stain worms, you can actually get different kinds of results and different staining patterns. Um, and then finally, ending up with viewing and imaging worms. And that process typically takes about 30 minutes. So hopefully this has made it abundantly clear that this method is ideal for in-class lab activities. If you want to set up a one-off experiment that allows students to learn how to work with live animals and do fluorescence microscopy, this is a great way to do that. You can also extend the timeline for viewing the stained worms up to several days after staining, which means that it's great for undergraduate research as well. If students have time constraints in which they can't necessarily be around for three hours in one day, they can stain the worms in one day and then come back to view them the next day. So I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of student obtained results of DII dye filling. So in this example, all of these worms were stained synchronously in larval stage three. And then these images were captured at 30 minutes, 24 hours and 48 hours after staining. And what you can see in the first two sets of images at 30 minutes and 24 hours, you have a fairly similar level of um, fluorescence intensity in each of those images, which shows you the power of being able to have flexibility with imaging this um, agent. Now, after about 48 hours, the fluorescence is still present, but it is starting to dim just due to things like photo bleaching and degradation of the reagent, um, but it can still be used even at that time point. So what I love about this is that at 30 minutes, you have imaging of a live worm that fits into a single lab period. And then if you're looking for consistent results that are best for student research, you might go with that 24 hour time point. And throughout all of this, you've got students learning the power of fluorescence imaging. The last thing that I wanted to follow up with is that DII dye filling can also be used to identify genetic mutations that impact ciliated sensory neurons. So if you're not interested in just having a single standalone lab exercise that allows students to work with animals and learn about fluorescence imaging, you can turn this into a longer term experiment. So for example, what I'm showing here are strains, um, the N2 wild type and another strain, YH2125, which has a loss of function mutation in the ciliary gene BBS5. Um, and these images were taken by students in my lab um, to look at the differences in DII staining in different strains. So in normal animals, you have a really clear pattern of staining in these ciliated sensory neurons, it goes all the way from the dendrites at the tip of the head into the cell bodies. 
And in the mutant animals, we typically either see partial or completely defective dye filling patterns. Um, and these results are consistent with published results. So it was really exciting for students to be able to get results that were also seen within the literature. Um, it's also really nice to know that in addition to DII, there are alternative forms of the stain DIO, which gives you a green fluorescent signal, and DID, which gives you closer to a far red signal. Um, and all three of these different dye forms work really well with transgenic fluorescent reporters. So if you have C. elegans strains that have, say, a GFP reporter in the background that you're really interested in looking at, you can do DII staining in that same background and look at both at the same time. Finally, um, I love that this idea or this method can easily be incorporated into larger long-term hypothesis-driven projects. Um, as I'm only in my second year at SOU, I haven't yet had the chance to bring this into the classroom. Um, so I don't have examples of that yet, but um, I'd be happy to talk to people about how this could be easily brought into a genetics or cell biology lab to test out and learn more about uh, mutations and genes that affect ciliated sensory neurons. Um, and to wrap up, I just want to thank the six undergraduate students who helped obtain the images that you saw here and write up the manuscript for this paper. Um, Three of these students have gone on, but three of them are still working in my lab. Um, and I would like to thank the Southern Oregon University Biology Department. Um, all four of us are keeping it going strong. <laughs> thank you, Melissa. That was a great talk. And I appreciated how you can adapt this for in-class projects and also undergraduate research projects. Our third speaker will be Dr. Kate Swissman. She's a professor and chair of the biology department at Vassar College. And she's been teaching an undergraduate biology laboratory where the students uh, develop their own projects. And the goal is to understand the effects of commercially available pesticides on the worm's nervous system. Um, she helped the students learn a wide variety of techniques that she calls a toolkit that they can use to complete their projects. And she's going to tell us today about how the students expose the worms to the pesticides and then image the fluorescent neurons. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Steele, for that in introduction and for in allowing me to share both in the method series as well as um, in this this symposium, the the work that that we've been doing. So I'm just going to get sharing here, and hopefully everybody can see my slides. So um, as as Dr. Steele mentioned, um, we I developed a, a multi week series of. Um, of laboratories that work very, very well with um, intermediate level undergraduate biology or neuroscience students. And um, I just want to tell you first a little bit about the, the course so you can get a sense of how we have the, the lab projects set up in context. So uh, first of all, as, um, as Jessica and Melissa both said, C. elegans can be used very effectively with undergraduate students from both introductory students, which I've developed lab modules for, for those uh, students, as well as more advanced students and even senior research um, thesis work. So of course, we all know that uh, C. elegans is a very powerful model organism where it's very easy, low cost to obtain different genetic mutants, to work with uh, genetic techniques like RNAi, um, as well as a number of behavioral assays for which we know the neurons that underlie those behaviors. Students can learn very important skills and techniques like microscopy, data analysis, statistical design, um, experimental design, um, behavioral and microscopy techniques, as well as genetic techniques. 
And students can really quite readily design experiments for themselves that have, you know, controls and different treatment groups that can carry out over a series of, of weeks. And many of these kinds of experiments can really be very low cost and really quite straightforward. So in, in this particular course that I've been teaching for a few years, it's an intermediate neuroscience and behavior course where students have had introductory biology, introductory chemistry, and um, also introductory psychology. So they come in with some skills, some lab skills, and this course is set up in a series of topics. And one of the topics is uh, neurotoxicology, kind of examining the effects of environmental chemicals, and in this case, pesticides, commercial formulations that you could buy at like Home Depot, and their effects on nervous system, behavior, um, and but with C. elegans, you could also look at other effects like uh, effects on reproduction, because we know that pesticides have widespread effects on multiple organisms, not just soil nematodes like C. elegans, but also vertebrates, um, other invertebrate organisms, even, even humans. And so um, this topic is of very strong interest to students and in the classroom, we read papers and um, talk a lot about the different sorts of impacts on nervous system and behavior in a whole host of different organisms. And so then the lab is a multi week module that accompanies this um, this neurotoxicology uh, topic and can run anywhere from three or four weeks to as many as six or seven weeks. It could even take up the bulk of the semester. And in the first few weeks, um, students can be introduced to the kind of techniques that I'll share in a moment while they're learning some of the background of this material. Then they can design experiments looking at a particular pesticide and they could explore neuronal effects using microscopy and behavioral effects. In some other renditions of the course, we also looked at reproductive damage, um, egg laying defects, egg hatching defects, which are also really quite amenable um, if the course is broader than just neuroscience. And so pesticides, as we know, have numerous cellular effects. Those effects um, can include oxidative damage, can include in inflammatory cascades, mitochondrial dysfunction, and many of these can underlie the sorts of um, cellular and behavioral changes that we see. What's really kind of striking about many pesticide exposure is that they can also have epigenetic and genetic effects that can have intergenerational effects. And so some students might choose to look at exposure of adult populations and then look at the progeny um, later on, depending on how much time they have to explore their projects. So most of the work that, um, that we've done together in this course is really to look at both short-term and longer-term effects on neuronal uh, cellular function and um, sort of taking advantage of the fact that many pesticides, particularly organophosphates, affect synaptic transmission and cholinergic neuron transmission in particular. And so um, we can look at different genetic strains under this context, as well um, as, as doing the manipulations with different concentrations or time courses of pesticides. It's really a very, very flexible lab format. And so um, they can, we can work with a variety of, of fluorescent strains to examine different neuronal subtypes that can match with particular behaviors. And so we've had really great success looking at cholinergic neuron strains such as LX929, um, a, a dopaminergic strain expressing GFP and dopamine neurons, OH7547 is a really terrific strain. Um, students have also looked at panneuronal strains like the M cherry uh, strain PVX4. So there's a, a bunch of different strains and they are very cost effective. So students could design projects to look at particular neuronal subtypes or to look at neurons more generally. And so to 
some of the skills that the students learn is they learn how to prepare plates with uh, cereal dilutions of a pesticide formulation they have chosen themselves. The students learn um, to to sort of apply the, the pesticide to the plates using a spreader that they can make themselves with a, a pasture pipe pet, or they could be prepared for them if you don't have as much time for students to do this sort of uh, groundwork in preparing the materials. Students learn to um, move worms, adult worms with picks or by washing with M9 buffer off of plates. And so they can prepare their pesticide containing plates and add their worms for short exposures that could happen within the four hour lab period or for longer term exposures um, if they're sort of doing an independent project where they could come in at, at different times of the week. The behavioral assays are very easy and straightforward and are available on Wormbook. And so some of the things that we've done in the lab is, is students have measured measured locomotion by counting body bends. They've also done projects where they've looked at chemotaxis capabilities to both volatile and non-volatile uh, chemicals. They've uh, done experiments where they've looked at um, the effects of pesticides on the basal slowing response, or a little more complicated one um, that students have done when they've continued work as, as seniors and sort of more advanced level is they can look at the, the crawl to swim or the swim to crawl transitions which involve dopaminergic neurons. And so some examples of results that students have obtained using these kinds of techniques. Um, include looking at the swim crawl um, transition after exposure to a commercial pesticide, a fungicide called Mancozeb, which, which um, affects dopaminergic neurons, and um, both looking at uh, general locomotion, which you can see here, and also the swim to crawl transition. You can see here the students can learn how to develop really quite sophisticated figures, and in this case, they develop their figures and analyze their data with uh, GraphPad Prism statistical software, but in other years we've had students use a variety of different statistical packages. And students have also assessed the neuronal integrity using a fluorescent microscopy um, uh, episode in, that can take just, just a four hour lab period where they can make auger or agarose padded uh, microscope slides and they can paralyze pick picked worms into a buffer containing uh, sodium azide. And here you can see they can look at, this was an experiment looking at the LX929, the cholinergic neuron um, labeled cell line. So they're looking at motor neurons. They can develop a, um, a pretty sophisticated, but really easy morphological sca scaling kind of technique where they can look at blebbing of, of the processes along the nerve cord. They can look at the cell body kind of swelling and they can do um, some quantitation along those lines. Some of the challenges, which I'm sure some of you are thinking about is that students need practice to develop these kinds of microscope skills. They need practice learning how to pick worms or how to work under a dissecting scope. Um, and so if you build in these sort of workshop weeks in the beginning of the semester, they really get skilled very quickly. The dissecting scopes need to have a sufficient magnification so they can manipulate worms under the microscope or so they can quantify some of these behaviors. And it, at Vassar, we have have um, a shared microscopy lab that has fluorescent microscopes that have digital imaging capabilities, but this can be really expensive if you're just getting a new series of, of labs off the ground, you may not have access to these fluorescent microscopes. So these are, these are some challenges to kind of keep in mind, but because of the flexibility of this kind of modular setup, you really could build in additional ways of understanding these behaviors without using the fluorescent microscopy. And so I have a feeling I've probably gone at least 10 minutes. So I'd like to thank um, Dr. Steele. I'd like to thank Joe for the opportunity to share this uh, lab module with you. I'd like to thank the many students in my neuroscience uh, 201 class who've done lots of really terrific work using this module format. 
the Department of Biology at Vassar College and some grant funding from our research committee. So thank you very much. You're muted, Louise. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kate. That was a great talk. Uh, and it was interesting to see all the various techniques that the students can adapt uh, to use the method. Uh, I too would like to thank all of our panelists and thank Jove and just take a minute to mention that the worm research community and the Genetic Society of America uh, really are supportive of faculty and students who do research at small campuses. Um, so if I assume many of you in the audience might be interested in getting into teaching, so that's a good place to start. Uh, and I think we'll take some questions now uh, about the methods or about life in undergraduate institutions. Just let me see what we have in the question and answer box here. One viewer has asked if you have some mutants regarding a particular disease or neurodegenerative disorder, can we use levamisole? And how would we address if levamisole is inhibiting that particular mutant because the mutant is already paralyzed? Okay, so for this assay, it really is essential that your animal can move, can swim. Um, to do this levamisole assay. Um, and for example, there are some mutants like LEV11, uh, a, a knockout mutant in LEV11, or that, that causes paralysis. So one way of, to get around that is actually to use the RNAi and do a partial knockdown. And by using RNAi, we, we can then perform the assay on that animal. Um, I also want to point out that, that levamisole itself binds to these postsynaptic, uh, you know, acetylcholine receptors. And so usually uh, altered sensitivity to levamisole indicates that there's a defect in the postsynaptic muscle. I like to use levamisole in the lab because even though our acetylcholine receptors and worm acetylcholine receptors are conserved, Levamisole can only act on the worm acetylcholine receptors. So it's completely non-toxic. There's another drug that can be used to study cholinergic signaling at the synapse, and that is aldicarb. Aldicarb binds to um, acetylcholinesterase. This is an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine at the synapse. Um, and this, you know, this affects acetylcholine acetylcholinesterase in both humans and uh, C. elegans. But aldicarb is the drug that is often used uh, to study mutants that have presynaptic defects, defects in the cholinergic neurons. Um, although some uh, presynaptic defects can ultimately result in changes in the muscle. And so those mutants can also have levamisole phenotypes. Uh, so it's important to think about the whole synapse, both pre and postsynaptic. And, and this is where students can make predictions, uh, go back into the literature to think about why their specific mutant might be giving, giving a phenotype. Thank you. And we have a question for Melissa. Can we use dye, I, dye and other dyes, for example, DCFHDA stain at the same time? Absolutely. Um, your, your only limitation is ensuring that you have fluorophores with different emission wavelengths. So um, this DII itself is usually viewed with a red filter. Um, so if you have say a green dye or a blue dye, uh, you can definitely combine those within the same animal. Um, just make sure you have those different colors. And if you're working with something that's normally a red color, you can switch to using something like DIO in order to allow you to have them in the same animal at the same time. Okay. And someone has given us a link to a DIY product page. If you're interested in that, you can click the Q&A section. 
let's see. We'll go with a question for Kate. Any concern in undergraduate labs using more toxic chemicals like levamisol and isn't sometimes dye-I dissolved in more hazardous chemicals? Um, sure, I think I think Melissa might want to address this as well. Um, yeah. But but we you know we have we have safety training for our students, and if you are going to be working with toxic chemicals, like when we work with some pesticides, we can have a workshop that helps to provide that training about how to work specifically and safely with um, those particular chemicals. I don't know if Melissa wants to chime in on this. Yeah, uh, we similarly have trainings. Um, we also, if you're doing like a one-off lab, if you're interested in trying to incorporate DII into just a single lab section instead of a whole term long activity, um, I will just start off a lab emphasizing the toxicity of a particular reagent that we're using, make sure students know they need to be using wearing gloves for the duration of the time that they're working with those chemicals, just to ensure that they know this is a really interesting and useful reagent, but not every reagent we use is necessarily safe to come in contact with. And I, I would say levamisole is completely safe um, harmless, it's soluble in water. Aldicarb, on the other hand, um, when I use aldicarb assays with my classes, I am the one that dilutes the aldicarb and then makes the plates. We never ever would do an aldicarb assay in liquid uh, because you know that could target our acetylcholinesterase as well. So, so that's why I really like using levamisole because it is perfectly safe to use with the undergrads. Okay. Here's another question for Kate. Someone's interested in studying mitochondrial defects of pesticides on worms. Do you have any suggestions for fluorescent strains to do that? I know that there are fluorescent strains. I don't have them right handy, um, right in the front of my mind, because we haven't been looking specifically at mitochondrial defects, but I would encourage you to um, you know, you can look this up through C. elegans resources, worm book, et cetera, and get some really great ideas. There are also some dyes that can, you know, fluorescent compounds that can be taken up differentially into mitochondria that can work well with C. elegans. I don't know if others of the on the panel have have some insights into this. We uh, actually, as part of um, this cure-based class, we I've had students that I've looked at uh, mitochondria in the muscles. I'm remembering a transgene FOX SI16, I think. A, a lot of these strains, of course, are available at the CGC. And the CGC is the Saraner Hepatitis uh, Genetic Stock Center, and they'll provide, man, they have hundreds, if not thousands of mutants that they will mail to you. And I think the current cost is about $10 per strain. And they're based at the University of Minnesota. Um, another, another series one time in this course, we had a whole section on aging. And there's a lot of really accessible aging mutants in uh, C. elegans. And you can you can actually do some, some really great straightforward experiments using aging mutants and looking at behavior and locomotion over time. And for those, for those they're more complicated because the instructor, you know, I would provide students with older worms for them to then um, kind of manipulate in various ways. And it's a little more time intensive, but I think this is very flexible. There are a lot of ways to combine behavior and neurons and um, a bunch of different really interesting topics. We have another DIY question. Is there a minimum stage at which DIY can be used? You stated L3. Can we use it for smaller stages like L1? And do you think the time of exposure is stage or age dependent? Great question. Um, so I have not personally tried using DIY on L1, but I do believe, and you know, someone knows better, they can correct me. I do believe that the ciliated sensory neurons, their external exposures are fully developed by the time that they reach larval stage one, which means they should be able to be dye filled with DII. 
Um, we typically look at it at later stages, L3 through adulthood. I also have not tried it on very old adults. Um, part of the reason I haven't tried that is because you get a lot of issues with autofluorescence, the older adult worms get, and that can make it harder for you to actually see what's neuron versus what's just autofluorescence. Um, so I typically focus on stages between L3 and young to mid adulthood. Um, but I would definitely believe that you should be able to use it on younger worms. Here's a quick question. Is dye eye toxic to the nematodes? It's not. Um, so you can dye fill animals at any age and let them grow on a plate and they will grow up, develop normally and have a normal reproductive cycle. Another great reason to work with it. Another question here, Dr. Tanis, have you ever seen levamisole resistance in animals with presynaptic defects? Generally, animals with presynaptic defects um, exhibit wild type sensitivity to levamisole. Uh, that being said, some of these uh, RNAi knockdowns that cause levamisole resistance um, that we identified in this genome-wide RNAi screen we still don't understand why they are resistant. And we see that some of those genes only appear to be expressed in neurons. Um, so I think this is a, an area that really is not, you know, fully explored. Although generally levamisole resistance is associated with altered cholinergic signaling in the muscle. We have a couple of questions here about bacteria. If we feed nematodes with different microbial strains, so most people use OP50, I think, uh, but if you used a different microbial strain, can you differentiate their neuronal changes by using dye eye? Potentially. It's very dependent on whether the microbial strains actually have an impact on specifically those externally exposed ciliated sensory neurons. Um, and they would have to have a sufficient enough structural or functional impact on the neurons to abolish the incorporation of that lipophilic dye. Um, so it's possible, uh, but it might not necessarily be the best way to go around assessing how microbes could cause neuronal damage. Maybe the cheapest and fastest though. <laughs> And this question goes a little beyond what we've talked about, but th there's a, a viewer who would like to test the virulence of a bacteria. Should they culture the C. elegans and bacteria on a plate and then in a clean 24 well plate, or just culture both the bacteria and C. elegans in a 24 well plate and count them? So this is, um, you know, this, this is when we use uh, RNAi for, for the levamisole assay, um, we pour the NGM with the additives, the IPTG and the CARB into the 24 well plates and then spot the RNAi clones into the wells. And we make a plate map at that point to know which RNAi clones are in which wells. And so I can imagine that if you're doing this with different bacterial strains, you just spot the different bacterial strains into the different wells, plate the worms into those wells and then perform the assay. Again, though, it's absolutely critical that those bacteria are dry before you put the worms in there, um, because if the bacteria don't dry, it just becomes a huge cloudy mess when you try to do the acid. Let's see here. Is there a difference in levamisole sensitivity at the different stages for inducing the paralysis, or is there just one protocol for all worm stages? You know, we have always done this assay on adults. Uh, so there, that is an experiment that you could have students do. You could test them at different life stages, um, being that they are synchronized. Uh, but, you know, it, if it appears that certain life stages do paralyze much faster, then you could, say, decrease the amount of the concentration of levamisole that's used. I think we've touched on all these questions so far. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to add? I did see one that um, ended up going into the answered section about working with some of the dyes 
um, and how long you can actually have worms just hanging around in the dye. Um, so I'm gonna give a shout out to another uh, previously published Jove paper where if you swim C. elegans in DII for longer periods of time, not only can it intercalate into the membranes of um, the exposed neurons, it can start to incorporate into other tissues as well. Um, so people have used DII to look at the composition of the cuticle um, and a lot of other structures in worms and also to get at another question that had popped up, they've not just used it in C. elegans. Um, it's great in C. C. elegans because they're transparent, but it's also been used in Drosophila larvae. It can be used in cell culture. Um, I think I've seen it used in tissues extracted from mouse and rat as well. So it's broadly used because it's simply a, a lipophilic dye. So it will inc incorporate it in, into really any membrane that it can get to. It's just a matter of adapting the protocol for what you want to use it for. I see another question here for Dr. Sussman. Do you immobilize the nematodes to evaluate the neuronal integrity on the agarose slides? And if yes, what do you use? Yes, I tried to type that answer. Um, we've, we've had good effect with uh, sodium azide for the, for the live mounts. And can you also tell us what you mean by swim to crawl transition and how do you analyze it? Sure. So if you have if you have a worm swimming in a droplet, which is very easy to do, right? You put can just put it right onto them and they can thrash around. Sometimes it's called, um, but I call it swimming. They they can either make their way out of the drop and then be crawling on auger, or the drop can evaporate and they'll be on auger. And in, in worms that have defects in their dopaminergic neurons, such as the pesticide damage that happens to them, they're not able to resume crawling once they're on auger. They're not able to get out of a drop if that's what they're doing, and they're not able to um, crawl once the drop evaporates. And so that's what we're calling the swim to crawl transition. Okay, thank you. Just scanning through the list here. <laughs> it looks like they were all answered. So again, I thank all of our panelists and I thank Joe and I thank all of you. Many of you are probably at small campuses and other locations around the world and it's great that we could be together today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Luis. And thank, thank you to all the other presenters and attendees. A lot of great questions. Um, so we'll we'll be sending sending out an email after this to all the registrants with a uh, recording of the webinar for your records, and we'll follow up. Um, you know, if anyone has any additional questions, just respond to our email, and we can take it from there. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye.